Okay, so I want to talk today about heat conduction or heat diffusion, and I'm going to uh, try to make it to trying to understand um, how long it takes to cook a frozen turkey for Thanksgiving, and uh, uh, why the seafloor uh, subsides subsides with time. So these two things are connected through the concept of heat conduction. So heat conduction is a type of uh, way to transfer um, heat or energy through heat. Um, it's one in which uh, there is no advection. The way to think about it is uh, imagine you have a, uh, a block here, okay, like a window pane, let's say, and outside it's hot and inside uh, it's cold. Okay, this would be like where I am right now in Houston, and you want to figure out how long does it take for that heat from the outside to propagate inwards uh, into your house through the window pane, and it does so by uh, making the temperature uh, at one point in in here. We can say T right here at X. This is X. And then this would be x plus the distance delta x. We'll call this dx. Okay. And the temperature is going to change as you go to the inside, uh, which is cold. And so what's really happening is all the atoms that make up the glass are stuck in their places, but when they're warm, they uh, vibrate more. And then they gradually, that vibration causes the neighbor to vibrate and so forth and so forth until you finally get over here. And when they feel that vibration, they start to get warm too. And it's the transfer of energy through uh, all these vibrations that causes, um, the, which is the phenomenon of heat conduction. Um, the key thing is the atoms are fixed. If the atoms were moving around, like if they were being blown by the wind, uh, that would be advection. We we ta start talking about conduction, uh, conduction uh, which I did in a previous lecture. So let's go back to my uh, window pane here to derive an equation for uh, how we think about heat diffusion. So what we're going to do on the is to write the equation out in words. On the left hand side, I'm going to say uh, rate at which um, window changes temperature, okay? And so that we could say dt over dt, the change in temperature of my window pane um, as, uh, per unit time. And what we really want to look at is the energy associated with that energy transfer. So um, for that, we have to write out the mass times the heat capacity, okay? The heat capacity is joules per kilogram uh, Celsius. Mass is kilogram. Temperature is Celsius. And this is seconds or time. And you see these things all cancel out you have joules per second, right? Which is watts. That's like how much energy it would take to power your light bulb, 70 watts, okay? Now the rate at which it, the window temperature changes or the energy content in the window changes is going to be related to um, any buildup of heat uh, inside. And so we can think about something like this where I'm gonna say Q at x plus dx uh, minus q at x, okay? And q is a heat flux. And when I talk about a flux, I mean that it's the amount of joules per meter squared. And that would be this area, how much heat is coming out here uh, divided by this cross-sectional um, area. And if this thing is in steady state, um, and I were sitting on this side right here, 
right? And it's somehow measuring the heat coming out to me. Um, if it turns out it's equal to the heat coming in, then the system is at steady state. And the temperature in, um, or the heat content in my window pane cannot change. But if they're not the same, okay, there is an imbalance and heat will build up or uh, decline within the window pane and the temperature will change. And so that um, build up is on the left hand side and the imbalance between what comes in, right? This is in and this is out, causes the buildup or the decline of heat content within there. Now, because I've uh, set my heat flux here as joules per meter squared, oh, it should be seconds, joules per second per meter squared, I need to multiply by the area, okay? And so what you'll have here is, uh, qx plus dx minus qx uh, times the area here. Now mass is um, density times volume, right? So this is kilograms per cubic meter times meter cubed. So we just have that. And of course, volume in this case would be um, the width of my window pane multiplied by uh, the cross-sectional area. And so if I plug this in, I'll have rho A at dx dt dt is equal to, what I'm gonna do here is this quantity right here, you can think of as the change in the heat flux. Um, so I can call that dq. Right, this is dq, and then multiplied by a, right? And the a's are going to cancel. Um, and so then you have, uh, oops, I forgot the c here. You'll have rho c dt dt little t is equal to um, dq dx, I took the dx to the other side. And so this equation right here is basically just telling you the same thing I said in words up here. The left hand side is the buildup of heat in the window pane, and the right hand side is basically uh, the imbalance between the heat coming out and coming in to the system. And when this quantity uh, is um, not zero, then obviously heat builds up. If it's zero, then this whole system, this whole equation goes to zero. Okay, so this equation does not require anything special to derive other than we uh, uh, did conservation of mass and conservation of energy. Now what we're gonna have to do is take into account um, how Q, what controls uh, heat flow. And that's where you need to use what we call these phenomenological laws. They're constrained by experiments. Um, and experimentally, or from observations, uh, there is this thing called the Fix Law of Diffusion. Or actually, for heat, I, sorry, I should say, it's the Fourier's Law. Fix Law is for uh, diffusion of, of uh, chemical constituents. But for heat, Fourier's Law of Thermal Diffusion, okay? And, and experimentally, it's shown that um, to first order uh, that the heat flux out of a system is proportional to the temperature gradient, what we call as dt dx. And that proportionality is related to, is called this thermal conductivity. And this is simply just to say that if the temperature contrast, or if the, if the temperature outside and inside of my uh, building uh, across the window pane is zero, then that's t, dt dx equals zero, then there should be no heat flow. If the temperature contrast between the outside and inside is very large, then of course there's gonna be heat flow. So you know that from intuition. And uh, it turns out, it's nice that it's a linear form where that uh, relationship is here in the thermal conductivity, which has units of watts, meter 
Kelvin or degree C, and I can draw Kelvin and uh, meter here, right? And so you can see where it ends up the Kelvin's cancel and it watts per meter squared, which is the same here as joules per second is a watt, right? So watts per meter squared. Okay. So this, remember, this thing is an observation. It's constrained by experiments. This equation is constrained by energy balance. That's it. So we can combine these two by putting that in here. And what you'll find is that you have rho C dt uh, dt is equal to d dx k dt dx, okay? Often uh, we uh, think of, so this is Q, right? Often we think of um, K for simplicity as being constant uh, with, with a spatial derivative in time. So we can take the K out, then you get this, dt t is equal to K over rho C. Um, and then when you combine these derivatives, you get the second derivative, okay? So the change in temperature as a function of distance within the uh, um, uh, window pane is given by this equation here. Reality, these are partial derivatives. And I'm also going to convert this K over rho C to another term called the thermal diffusivity. This is dt, dt, partial derivatives, would be a kappa times d squared t dx squared. because you actually have to look at this in multi dimensions. And if you're uh, used to um, vector calculus, then this would be equivalent to dt kappa del uh, star t, okay? The, the divergence of the gradient of t, okay? This is the equation, and this is the diffusion equation that we derive. Now kappa, I just mentioned here, is K over rho C for most, so uh, thermal conductivity and density and heat capacity all change their material properties. Uh, the interesting thing is they, uh, so they change with temperature and pressure, um, but they kind of change together with temperature. And so the whole quantity here tends to be uh, more independent. This is the thermal diffusivity. So although conductivity, and density and heat capacity depend on temperature, the thermal diffusivity itself does not depend that much, which is sort of nice. This has units of meters per second squared, or um, for geologists, uh, kilometers squared per million years for a typical rock. Um, we're talking 10 to the negative six meters per second squared. Uh, my, sorry, meters squared per second. Okay, uh, messed up there. <clears throat> and for in these units, it's about thirty kilometers squared per million years. So. Conductivity, K, uh, tells you how efficient heat can be transferred. Um, and then kappa is, uh, of course, that total efficiency depends on the density of, of the material. So thermal diffusivity really is the measure of how efficient um, heat is transferred through your substance. Okay, so now what we're going to do is do some uh, dimensional an analysis, okay? We're gonna consider um, the case, let's say you wanted to uh, cook your frozen turkey in the oven. It comes out, throw it in there at zero degrees and you heat up the surroundings and you have to wait for that uh, temperature, to, uh, hot temperature from the oven to propagate into the core of the uh, turkey, okay? But how long does it take? Well, what we can do, going back to look at this equation here, is we can define, um, some characteristic uh, uh, variables. So T star is some characteristic, you might call it whatever, it might be the temperature of the oven, right? 
and we might call um, uh, x star, right, the radius of the turkey, right? That's the only relevant uh, size there. And then we can define some terms, like what I call a T bar would be the one where there are no units. Uh, you take um, your actual temperature and divide by T star, right? Same thing with X bar without units, you take X divided by X star and plug all those things in there. And what you'll get is L T T, right? Oh, we should also do one for the time scale. And we don't know what that is, but we'll just call it some characteristic time scale here. Um, so T is equal to T over T. So this would be a tau here, and this would be a T star, right? And then this would be kappa still. This would be a T star T. Now, this one, uh, there's X to the squared. So you basically have X star squared here, okay? So you'll notice that the T stars cancel. And then um, I would get an equation that looks like this, where it's kappa tau over x star squared, d squared, d x squared. Okay. And I'm running out of space here. Um, let's see who can erase all this. So if you look at this equation, this quantity right there um, has to equal some sort of constant without uh, any units. And because that it equals that constant, we can actually say something like x star is uh, must scale with the square root of kappa tau. And this is what we call the diffusive length scale. This is the diffusive time scale. Okay. Which is to say that if I want to cook a turkey um, of uh, radius x star, it's going to take me, uh, the, the amount of time it takes me to cook it, is going to scale this way, or tau is going to be x squared over kappa, okay? That's to cook the turkey cooking time, okay? So this is something you want to remember. Okay, now going back to the turkey, um, we can then uh, expand on that. If you go to the um, supermarket and you buy a turkey, they'll have a table at the back and they'll give you the times it takes to cook your turkey uh, for different uh, turkey weights. And um, instead of radius, because it's easier to weigh the turkey than to, um, than to determine its radius, I suppose. Um, so let's try to convert this cooking time right here into uh, a relationship for the mass of the turkey. And to do that, we're gonna assume my turkey here is a nice, beautiful sphere. Uh, not real, but let's, let's do that anyway, with the radius r. Okay, so we're gonna do r, and then the density of the turkey, which is probably about that of water. And so you have to make, you have to realize that the volume of the turkey is four thirds pi r cubed. We know that the density is the mass divided by the volume. So if you have, rearrange these, then you can get an equation where the mass is four thirds 
um, pi densely r cubed, and um, the radius then equals uh, mass over four thirds pi density to the one third. And if I put this in for the x star, I'm going to just use r for x, then what you'll find is the time to take to, uh, to cook a turkey will be one over kappa m over four thirds pi rho two thirds. Okay. Most important thing here is if, if kappa is very high, a very conductive turkey, you can cook it fast. You don't really have much option to play with that, but the mass matters um, and it, it scales with the two thirds power. The bigger your turkey, the longer it takes, but it's not linear, it's to the two thirds power. So as an exercise, you can go and look at that yourself under these tables and plot them up see if that, that works, okay? All right, that's the turkey cooking time. So how does this all relate to say, um, uh, what I was started off with was the subsidence of the ocean basins, okay? I'm gonna erase all of this here um, and leave mainly the most important quantities here. And that is this scaling um, up here. We're going to make some observations. If I were to plot a couple of things with the ocean basins, if I put uh, time, okay, and I plotted um, this thing, we'll call this a little h. This is the depth below the sea level, right? So at the axial ridge, it starts off say two kilometers, so this is h, right? But with time, it subsides. It gets deeper and deeper and deeper, but not linearly. In fact, this thing goes with the square root of time, okay? Scales that way. We also have found that uh, if you were to measure q, the surface heat flow versus time, that would be you measure uh, it's a skin measurement. You put a probe into the sediments um, at different depths. And you measure the temperature gradient right there and you multiply by the thermal conductivity and that gets you surface heat flow. And that one we found decays with the square root of time. Okay. So somehow the ocean basins seem to be getting colder in the sense that they are, uh, the heat flux through them is getting small. So what's happening is that in a convective system, so uh, this is the whole mantle, by the way, right here, and you have an upwelling from convection. I talked about the ray number before, and then so you have a hot mantle. This is hot, rising to the surface, which is cold up there, and it hits that, and this hot mantle starts to cool off, just like the turkey, except in the turkey case it was heating up. Here we're cooling off. And um, as it does so, it moves sideways and, and, and then comes down. And the reason why it, um, uh, it comes down is because as it's moving sideways, it's getting colder and colder and colder, losing all that heat until it thermally contracts and sinks uh, back down. Okay. So uh, what we can do is zoom in on this region. And what's actually going on is that if I plot temperature versus uh, depth, right? Then at the ridge, you have hot mantle coming right up to essentially to the surface. You can think about that as the potential temperature, but immediately it starts to cool and it'll cool down like that at a given time. And at any given time, you would see thermal profiles that look like this, that keep propagating downwards and getting colder and colder. These things are called thermal boundary layers, okay? And they essentially control what we call uh, the lithosphere or the tectonic uh, plates because uh, rheology is so dependent on uh, temperature. So when they're cold, they're rigid. And that coldness, the, the boundary layer 
uh, continues to go uh, propagate deeper and deeper. The average temperature, by the way, the boundary layer doesn't change much because the potential temperature can remain constant. The surface is constant at zero, so the average is always somewhere in between. Like say right, right here this is the average temperature. But that temperature difference uh, with respect to the surrounding mantle, call this delta T, right, um, corresponds to a density contrast, right, of rho alpha delta T, right? Alpha is the thermal expansion coefficient. And that densifies uh, the mantle. And it want, uh, the lithosphere, the thermal boundary, and so it wants to sink. Now, Sinking is, of course, always controlled by uh, what we call buoyancy. And buoyancy is not just density, but size. Size matters uh, here. And we talked about uh, isostasy uh, previously, which was that if you, the elevation of mountains or ocean basins, which are neg would be negative, is delta rho um, over rho. This is the density conscious between your boundary layer and the surrounding mantle, right? Times um, the thickness of your, your body. In this case, we're going to call that L. So my thickness of my thermal boundary layer is L. This is the thermal boundary layer, right? right? And we know using this that L, the time it takes to propagate downward uh, uh, for uh, scales as like that, so it's the square root of kappa times tau, or the, the time. So if I plug this in, to here, then I would have this. Well, let me put in my temperature contrast stuff, delta T. Say so that's a constant. And this would then be kappa uh, tau. So this right here explains that how the seafloor subsides um, with time, but with the square root of time. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, now, we can also look at the heat flow. Well, remember, heat flow at the surface is going to scale with um, thermal conductivity, dt, uh, dz, right? And we can look at these thermal boundary layer uh, thermal profiles. They're curved, of course, but um, maybe we can approximate them as being linear. So it's an approximation. Actually, this is over here is not approximate, you could say K, thermal conductivity, and the temperature delta T would be the potential temperature um, minus the surface temperature, which is zero. I'm just going to call that delta T. That's not going to change too much. Um, and then that change occurs over a distance that is roughly that of the thermal boundary layer, L. And that thermal boundary layer, again, taking into account for that, it's K delta T square roots of kappa t. Okay, so once again, now we can see that the surface heat flow um, is going to scale inversely with the square root of time, and this is why surface heat flow uh, declines. So you can, uh, if you knew the plate velocity, p, right, um, which would be uh, the distance from the ridge, let's say distance from the ridge divided by time, you can replace this time with distance and put all the observations on Earth together and you will see that they follow this beautiful trend up until some point. When they hit about 70 million years, they tend to flatten out and then eventually they subduct and disappear. And we'll talk about that later. 